I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, four Israelis are now missing because of Hurricane Irma. Israeli airstrikes make a surprise attack in Syria, and we're about to count down the most elite neighborhoods in the Holy Land. So stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Hurricane Irma has begun its deadly assault, unleashing devastation in the Caribbean islands where it's already claimed at least 10 lives. Now, we've just gotten word that Israel's foreign ministry has lost complete contact with four Israeli citizens who were there when the storm hit. Already the most enduring Category 5 on record, Hurricane Irma is the largest storm ever seen in the Atlantic. The blackout of contact with these four Israelis is a major cause for concern, with officials reporting disastrous flooding and injuries throughout the Caribbean. Irma has left two-thirds of homes in Puerto Rico without power and is about to hit Haiti, where nearly three million people are expected to be affected by the deadly storm. But the worst damage of all may come when the storm hits South Florida this weekend. Florida Governor Rick Scott has issued a mandatory evacuation of several coastal cities, and President Trump has announced a state of emergency in the state. So if you're one of the people in Irma's path, this isn't a time to take any chances. Well, Israel has just launched a massive airstrike against a weapons plant in Syria, one that's believed to be developing deadly chemical weapons for the Syrian army. The attack came as a complete shock to Syria and Lebanon, who have now confirmed two Syrians were killed by the Israeli air assault. This comes nearly 24 hours after the UN's report that the Syrian president's forces used deadly sarin gas attacks at least 20 times over the last four years. In several instances, government forces use chemical weapons against uh, civilians in opposition-held areas, including Khan Shaikun Idlib on 4th April. We gather extensive evidence, including 43 interviews and victims, with victims, sorry, eyewitness, first responders, medical staff, and persons who visit the site, as well as photos of remnants and satellite imagery. On the base of this information, we concluded that the chemical attack was carried out by a Syrian Su-22 aircraft, which dropped three conventional bombs and sarin bomb in Khan Shaikhoun. The sarin attack had killed over 80 individuals, most of them women and children, and injured hundreds of others. Israel has been known to make strategic air attacks on Syrian targets, but only in isolated cases and when absolutely necessary. Above all else, the IDF is especially concerned with preventing Iranian and Hezbollah influence in the area, which has escalated in recent years as Syria continues to grow increasingly unstable. This overnight sneak attack against or in Syrian territory, however, potentially marks a huge turning point in Israel's military strategy. It demonstrates that Israel can not only successfully carry out airstrikes even with Russian defenses in place, but also indicates that Israel may be taking a stand in a war that it's mostly stayed out of until now. It's looking more likely that this may be because Hezbollah was gearing up to take over the weapons plant from Syria. While the IDF doesn't comment on military operations like this, army officials have strongly hinted that the attack came to prevent Hezbollah from obtaining cutting-edge and legal weapons being developed at the site. On top of the six-year-long civil war gripping Syria, the region is also faced with ongoing military conflicts with the Islamic State. The Syrian army has just had a major breakthrough on that front by breaking a 28-month-long siege by ISIS of the city of Deir al-Azol. The Islamic State has laid horrific siege to the city for over two years, cutting off food and water to the civilians trapped inside. There's been little hope for the city until now, after 840 days, when the Syrian army finally drove the Islamic State soldiers from the city's gates. This is seen as a major victory for Assad's army and marks a turning point in the war to free the region from jihadist extremism. Well, joining us now in the studio to take a closer look at the recent Israeli airstrikes in Syria is Dr. Moldechai Kedar. Dr. Kedar lectures at Bar Ilan University and served for over 25 years in the IDF military intelligence. So clearly, Israel 
isn't too apprehensive to strike first. Do you think that Israel got permission or was in contact with the international community regarding this specific strike? Well, there is no international community when it regard, when regard to Syria. There is only two parties which Israel should uh, take into account. One is Russia, and the other one is the United States of America. Uh, with Russia, we have long time uh, uh, understanding that both countries actually bomb in Syria whenever they see fit their interest. So Russia is doing it big time, Israel doing it little time, uh, once in a while, and as we saw uh, last night, allegedly, Israel has done it. However... So did Russia we, know about this? Or did the United at States... At least know? retroactively. I'm not sure that Israel uh, uh, cop, uh, or coordinates these things with the Russians because they will tell the, the mm -hmm. Syrians, but I suspect that it was coordinated with the White House before the, the strike. I suspect. I mm -hmm. have no idea about this. I have no information. However, we have to look at the, this strikes. So, so you would say, are we... Should we be waiting for any sort of retribution? Look, or whenever Israel sees some kind of a weapon, allegedly a chemical weapon, ready to get to go to Lebanon to Hezbollah, Israel strikes. This is the what happened for the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. However, we have to look at this in a twofold uh, uh, way. One is the tactical issue. Yes, getting rid of some weapons which might go to Lebanon, mm -hmm. definitely. But the other thing is that today. Syria, especially after what happened in Deir ez-Zor, is about to enter a new phase of reshaping the country again with all kinds of parties, with Iran, Russia, the Kurds, and Assad, of course, and the, the reshuffling of the cards in Syria. Israel did not take part in the war so far. Right. So Israel is out of the game. Because or Israel is didn't I mean, counter well, What does this kind of now, tell this, us about this what kind, is going to This kind of, of attack is actually signaling by Israel, mm -hmm. hey guys, you cannot reshape Syria without taking us in account. Because we have the power, we have the ability, and we act. So please, dear guys, the Russians, the, the Iranians, and the, and, the, and the Syrians, take us in account. We have also uh, needs about Syria, of course. We need, we need the Iranians to be as far as, as could mm -hmm. be from the Israeli borders. And we will hit when needed. Interesting. You know, it's funny because yesterday we were talking about Israel's, um, you know, entrance into Syria about a decade ago to strike a nuclear reactor yep. within Syrian exactly territory. Exactly what happened the same. And don't forget that that nuclear uh, facility near the Euphrates was a co-production of the North Koreans, Again, North Koreans, mm -hmm. because it was the same facility as in Yongbyon, uh, which they have there. It was Iranian money, and it was Syrian soil. This was a co-production, and Israel got rid of it. Okay, so the same thing continues until this very day, and it will continue. All right, well, thank you so much for Pleasure. joining us. Several months ago, the terror group Hamas launched a series of cyber attacks on IDF soldiers and attempted to steal critical intel through social media channels. Well, now the Army has just announced Operation Social Resistance, its first ever simulation to combat social media attacks. Hamas's cyber cells were unmasked earlier this year after terror operatives tried to turn IDF soldiers' social media accounts against them. The terrorists created fake social media pages to pose as attractive women on Facebook, sometimes even Israeli women, and tried friending hundreds of Israeli soldiers. Though only a small fraction returned the friend requests, it allowed the Hamas cyber spies to strike up a conversation, ultimately asking the soldiers to click on a link. The soldiers who followed the link were walking into a trap, launching secret spyware on their devices that turned their phones into walking wiretaps. Dozens of fake Hamas accounts have been exposed over the last few months, and now the IDF has launched a military simulation to stop similar social media hacks, the first ever of its kind. Top IDF brass knows that only a small percentage of soldiers fell for Hamas's trap, but that even one breach could be enough to cause massive damage to Israel. Soldiers are now undergoing special training to spot, prevent, and thwart cybercrime as soon as they see it, giving a big thumbs down right on Hamas's plan. Israel has just received an unprecedented offer from the leader of Hamas after spending 22 months in an Israeli prison. Top Hamas official Hassan Youssef is now saying the terror group is prepared to lay down its weapons in a ceasefire deal 
if, of course, Israel lifts its blockade of Gaza. With us to explain is ILTV's Brett Allen Smith. Now, Brett, is this an offer Israel can trust? I mean, how realistic is this? Thanks, Dasha. Well, this is definitely a surprising offer, um, but there's a lot to consider first before Israel can really take anything seriously. So first of all, Hamas is in a very difficult place right now. I mean, things are just falling apart in Gaza. The Palestinian Authority has been hitting them with sanction after sanction, and with fewer and fewer allies in the region, they could really be running out of options at this point. Now, this offer is coming just after the head of the UN's Middle East visit, which included a tour of Gaza, at the end of which he called on Israel, Egypt, and the PA to lift their sanctions and fix the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. So the timing can't just be coincidence on this one. And what is Hamas saying they'll offer in return? Well, according to Hassan Yosef, they're prepared to offer a long-term ceasefire deal with Israel in exchange for Israel more or less completely lifting the Gaza blockade. Now, that would mean total freedom of movement in and out of the Strip. That's imports and exports, just everything. And obviously, all Israelis are not too thrilled with terms like that, even if Hamas does stick to their promise of upholding a ceasefire, as it opens up a lot of security concerns. Now, let's go ahead and uh, check out the report. The head of Hamas has just come forward with a surprising offer. Hassan Youssef has been the terror group's leader and co-founder since 2005, after serving as the visible leader of the Second Intifada. Even still, Youssef is considered to be among the more conservative of Hamas's leaders, despite the fact that he just served over a year and a half in an Israeli jail for inciting violence against Israel. But this latest offer is certainly a surprising one, and comes less than a week after Youssef was freed from prison. The Hamas leader has just announced that Hamas is prepared to enter a long-term ceasefire deal with Israel on the condition that all blockades of Gaza be completely lifted. With conditions in the Strip getting worse and worse, especially over the last few months, many speculate that this may be an offer seriously worth considering. In a private interview with Israeli media, Youssef promised that Hamas would honor the terms of a ceasefire if the blockade was dropped, citing that as per their agreement, Hamas hadn't fired a single rocket into Israel since the end of 2014's Operation Protective Edge. Though Hamas may be in a tight spot, many Israelis see the lifting of the Gaza blockade as something that would only strengthen Hamas as a threat, opening the floodgates for weapons into, and armed terrorists out of, the Strip. Regardless, the fact that Hamas's leader is willing to even make the offer in the first place certainly could mean that they're hoping for some kind of change, and may be willing to put their money where their mouth is. Yesterday marked the 45th anniversary of the terror attack during the 1972 Olympics, three days which saw the brutal murder of 11 Israeli athletes by Palestinian terrorists. Well, now Israel's President Ruven Rivlin has just attended an event in Munich to unveil a special memorial for the Munich victims 45 years after that fateful event. President Rivlin appeared at the memorial's inaugural event to commemorate the tragic events that unfolded when the Black September terror group took 11 Israelis hostage at the Munich Olympics. The crisis ended in tragedy those many years ago when all the hostages were murdered by their Palestinian captors. Germany's President Frank Walter Steinmeier took the stage and admitted the tragedy should have never been allowed to happen. But for many, this memorial is only the beginning of a long, unkept promise to commemorate the tragedy. Calling out Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, Rivlin announced that the Palestinian government had recently celebrated the Munich massacre as an act of heroism and that the Olympic community had a responsibility to call out terrorism for what it was. To this date, the Olympic Games have refused Israeli requests to hold a minute of silence at the beginning of ceremonies to commemorate the murders, justifying that such a move would compromise the game with politics. This memorial is a product of years of negotiations held between the victims, relatives, and the International Olympic Committee, a massive exhibition that preserves the events leading up to and including the bloody aftermath. The committee plans to establish a school of democracy nearby in the near future, built on the site where the German police's failed rescue attempt ended in tragedy. A Democratic congressman has just announced a stunning new amendment. He's proposing that the United States send $12 million to Israel's struggling Ethiopian community. Now, ILTV's Aaron Porras has more on the story. Now, Aaron, this, you know, it's a wonderful thing, obviously, but what inspired a Florida congressman to essentially take up the cause of the Israeli-Ethiopian community? Well, I can't, I can't speak to his personal drives or motives, but um, I can say that historically, Congressman Hastings has been a friend to the Israeli-Ethiopian community, and, and that 
history goes back at least 20 years. You know, he's been coming to he's been coming to Israel just during his tenure at least 20 times or upwards of 20 times. Uh, and, and and in fact, this current bid to increase funding uh, or to appropriate funding towards the Ethiopian Israeli community, his, those efforts at least go back to 2015. Interesting. Now, is this bill likely to pass? Um, again, unfortunately, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you um, on whether or not that sort of thing would, would go through. But what I can say is, again, unfortunately, Hastings' reputation on Capitol Hill kind of precedes him, and, and it's not such a great reputation. Um, uh, his okay. certain allegations against him number everything. You know, they, they range in the list from sexual harassment and nepotism to bribery. Um, so unfortunately, even though this is a, you know, a very nice bill, it looks like the reputation of his colleagues and the, and the co-signers of the bill are really going to be, uh, I Heavily think, the driving force right. yeah, behind any, any major decisions that are made. So I'll tell you more in the report, though. The plan would help Ethiopians integrate into modern Israeli society, giving them critical assistance with language learning and adapting to Israeli customs. This amendment comes from Representative Elsie Hastings, one of Florida's House representatives on Capitol Hill, and someone who's visited Israel 18 times during his term in office. Israel's Ethiopian community is a cause he's been closely involved with over the years, and now he's hoping to help the Israeli government come up with the money it needs to help assist the minority make the difficult transition into Israel. There are nearly 150,000 Ethiopians living in Israel today, the majority of them born in Ethiopia. But the community has faced difficulties integrating into the Jewish state, often citing police brutality and discrimination from the Israeli public. The Ministry of Education believes they need around $20 million to fund programs that can help Ethiopians integrate, and clearly the congressman is hoping this $12 million bill can help get things done. What does the Israeli-Ethiopian community Bob Marley and ice cream have in common? Stumped? Well, let me just tell you that the answer to this little riddle is probably the greatest reason I've ever found to eat a whole pint of Ben & Jerry's. And here now to tell us more is Avi Zinger, the CEO of Ben & Jerry's Israel Factory. Thank you so much for coming in. First of Good all, you must have the best job in the world, right? I feel like it. Yeah, you have. You get ice cream. I mean, your house is probably full of this ice cream all day long, so... Yeah. Doesn't sound me, too bad my to family, me. everybody around me, they love ice cream and we have it. Yeah, you, and you we got have the best one. Absolutely, and you have to be passionate to uh, yeah. to work in it too. So, tell us about the One Love uh, promotion. We have this incredibly tasty looking ice cream in front of us, and I understand that um, it has a very special story behind it, right? Yeah, the, the you know Ben and Jerry's uh, approached the Bob Marley family. Uh, in order to, you know, to you know, Bob Marley, his vision was love and uh, make the world a better one, uh, which is the same with Ben and Jerry's. Right. So they they approach him uh, to celebrate the 40 years for the Exodus uh, album, mm -hmm. uh, and they asked him to come out with a flavor. So they developed the flavor together. It's a banana ice cream with a swirl of uh, caramel, a swirl of uh, graham cracker, mm -hmm. and a uh, peace sign, chocolate peace sign. There are chocolate yeah. peace signs inside this ice cream as if it's not exciting enough. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, I mean, I, I don't even want to ask what this tastes like, because I'm, uh, I mean, we're going to have to try, try this by the end yeah. of it, by the end of the interview, but let's talk a little bit about um, the philanthropic side of this ice cream flavor. So the, the agreement with Ben & Jerry's in the U.S. is uh, that uh, part of the sales will go to uh, a foundation, the Bob Marley Foundation in Jamaica, and will support a young artist in uh, Jamaica. Interesting. We asked the, family, the Marley family uh, to do the same thing, but with the Ethiopian community. It turned out to be that the Ethiopian community is very, uh, you know, they love music, they love Bob Marley. Bob Marley himself was a Rosbaterian, you know, he was very connected to Ethiopia. So they agree. And uh, we hooked up with the uh, ENP, the, uh, which is, as we found out, the number one uh, organization that supports uh, the Ethiopian. And uh, what we do, we, Number one, we collect uh, money from ourselves. We do like a, a journey with them to companies. We, we, we give the ice cream away. People are donating money. 
and the money goes to them, and this way we introduce their activity. So, so when I buy a pint of One Love Ben & Jerry's ice cream, is that money going also towards Three percent of the sales are going to them. That's amazing. Okay, and so this, and, is a and this money goes to, we started a, a project in uh, Ramle, mm -hmm. which there is a very big uh, Ethiopian community. We're supporting the community center there, and we, we build like a, a small uh, project uh, for, uh, you know, with uh, agriculture. Agriculture was very big in Ethiopia. When the families are coming here, there's a very big difference between the, the young generation and the older generation. Right. So uh, through the agriculture part, uh, they are getting you know more together, uh, so each family get uh, like a small por a small uh, piece of uh, garden, and this is how they beautiful. Yeah. Well, it seems like um, clearly Ben and Jerry's is doing something that's that's very very important uh, for this country as well. And on that note, I think we should try this amazing ice cream. So I can actually recommend it to you guys after having had a taste. Right? It looks good. Let me make sure it's, it's... We have to get one of those uh, chocolate peace signs as well. Here we go. Guys, I can officially recommend this ice cream. <laughs> in fact, I think I'm going to be keeping this in the studio for it's the rest of... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. All right, it's time for our top five with ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh. Okay, well, other than Israel's delicious culinary scene, endless adventures, and crazy nightlife, I'm here to give you guys the top five elite neighborhoods in Israel. To start off our list, we have the neighborhood of Savion, ranked 10 out of 10 on the Israeli socioeconomic scale and is one of the wealthiest municipalities in Israel. Definitely worth a drive around to see some of the most beautiful homes in Israel, and the best part, it's just a short drive from Tel Aviv. At number two, we have Kesalia, the town located between the major cities of Tel Aviv and Haifa on the coastal plain. The town, populated with close to 5,000 people, is rich in history, beauty, and culture. Often, concerts by major Israeli and international artists are hosted at the Roman Theater, located in the stunning city, and it's pretty well known that you haven't made it in Israel until you've performed in Kesalia. Our number three is the wealthy beachfront district of Herzliya Pituach, located in Herzliya. If it wasn't clear enough, anyone that has the option will live walking distance from the Mediterranean Sea. Herzliya Pituach is known for its robust startup and entrepreneurial culture. Herzliya itself in 2015 had a population of close to 92,000 residents and Pituach about 10,000. Named after Theodore Herzl, the founder of modern Zionism, Herzliya is home to numerous embassies as well as important business people. No surprise, it's one of the elite. Cliffside to the Mediterranean Sea, we have the city of Al Suf. Around 21 miles south of Kesalia, the site of Al Suf was intensively excavated from 1994 and in 2002 was named Apollinia National Park. Some remains include the medieval city wall, a crusader castle, and many more enriching Al Suf's history and culture. Oh, de Sharon, now you can consider this neighborhood elite even just by glancing at the residence list. Starting off with famous model Barif Faeli, as well as former Israeli ambassador to the United States, Danny Ayalon, and so many more. In 1990, Hoda Sharon was officially declared a city, merging four towns into one, and since has flourished into becoming one of the most stunning neighborhoods in Israel. Stay tuned for our next Top 5. Back to you. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. I don't want to toot my own horn, but I can tell you that all of you watching us at home have excellent taste in where you decide to get your news. That brings me to today's word, tam, meaning flavor or taste. Tam can refer to a specific flavor like a soda be tam tapuach, or an apple flavored soda, or it can refer to your preferences like your tam be sidrot, or taste in television shows. Oddly enough, it can even be used to show dissatisfaction or a feeling of pointlessness, like if you said, in tam lavod, meaning there's no taste in working. The one thing you should always remember, though, is that in lidvakeach betaam vereach, or there's no argument in matters of taste and smell. Translated plainly, to each their own. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be clear with a low of 73 or 22 degrees Celsius. The weekend is also expected to be clear, but we'll have a rise in temperatures to an unseasonably high 
heat or temperature of 88 or 31 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.55 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.